Welcome to our penultimate session of the hagiography of Peter Fan. This is going to be the most hagiographical session of all, I suspect, um, except for when Peter talks himself. Um, we have three wonderful speakers who have all known and worked with Peter for many years, and they're going to share some perspectives on the legacy and work of Peter Fan in general. First of all, it's my great pleasure to introduce John O'Malley, who's a Jesuit priest and university professor here in our Department of Theology at Georgetown. John's speciality is the religious culture of early modern Europe, particularly Italy, and he's also an expert on the Second Vatican Council and, as you'll soon find out, the First Vatican Council too. John has held a number of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, and other academic organizations. Among his many publications are What Happened at Vatican II. As he once told me, there is no question mark in that title. <laughs> now in six languages, might be more now, is it? Yeah. No, six. six languages, and Trent, What Happened at the Council. Uh, his new book, I think, is going to be called What Didn't Happen at Vatican I. <laughs> <laughs> the Trent book is available in five languages and was the winner of the John Gilmary uh, Shea Prize for the best book in 2013. Uh, in 2016, the Graduate Schools of Arts and Sciences of Harvard University conferred on John its Centennial Medal, the school's highest honour. Uh, please join me in welcoming John O'Malley. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Gerard. Can you, can you hear me back there? Yeah. Uh, it's a delight to be here and uh, especially to honor my good friend uh, Peter Fahn. I had heard Peter speak before I came to Georgetown in 2006, but I really didn't know him. But uh, we soon established a very close relationship. I won't describe that relationship in words because, Mary, one picture is worth a thousand words, so you're going to get a, just pass, there are not enough copies for everybody, you can just take a glance and pass it along. I'm an eBay this picture. Can we have that back I, so I these people can see it? Yes, I thought it was right before Leonard. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> no. It's priceless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take us someplace that we haven't been yet in this conference. I assume that many of you have been to the Sistine Chapel, and that's where we're going to do this. Where we're going to do this? Go this afternoon. Uh, people go to the Sistine Chapel for various reasons. But of course, principal among them is to see Michelangelo's frescoes, and especially the fresco of the ceiling, with those stories from the first uh, chapters of the Book of Genesis, but also the Last Judgment. So we're always we're all, we're I think generally familiar with those panels. It includes the magnificent uh, creation of Adam. What people don't pay much attention to is uh, the frame for those uh, panels namely those uh, monumental portraits of the prophets, the prophets who, of course, foretold the coming of Christ. But when you take a second look, uh, it's not just the prophets, at least not just the Hebrew prophets, it's also the Sibyls, those mantic uh, pagan priestesses who believed in the Renaissance had some kind of premonition of uh, the coming of Christ, and therefore the prophets and the Sibyls are, are located atop the series of uh, portraits of the ancestors of Jesus. So it's all looking forward to the birth of Jesus. My point is that in the Pope's own chapel in the Renaissance, this idea that there was some kind of religious truth, some kind of connection with Christianity was right there in front of anyone who walked into the chapel. Moreover, if you enter the chapel from the ceremonial door at the far end and walk up towards the altar and look above the altar, you'll see that the prophet 
painted above the altar is the prophet Jonah. Why Jonah? Jonah was a lesser prophet. We have Isaiah and Ezekiel and so forth. Why, why Jonah? Well, if you look carefully, there's a little whale tucked in his arm. So, did Christ uh, be th three days in the tomb just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale? So this is right above the altar, the altar of the, about the death, uh, suffering death and resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus. So that fits, but also, Jonah was a Hebrew prophet to the Gentiles. He's a Hebrew prophet to the Ninevites. Uh, and there he is flanked by the Sibyls. And the Ninevites converted and were beloved of God. So that brings me to the Italian Renaissance. <laughs> <laughs> Which was my original field of endeavor. Uh, what do I want to say about the Renaissance? First of all, uh, we have to get rid of two uh, pre uh, prejudices we may have. One from the 19th century, that uh, the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, was essentially a pagan movement, uh, or at least a religiously neutral movement. I think it's now generally acknowledged by scholars that it was fundamentally a Christian movement. Now that has to be qualified in many ways, but uh, I think that's uh, now pretty widely accepted uh, that this re re revival of the pagan classics and so forth was part of something else. So that's the first prejudice we need to make sure we're, we not, are not enjoying. And the second uh, prejudice is, or not prejudice, but question is revival of what? Renaissance, rebirth, rebirth of what? Well, commonly it's the rebirth of the literary classics of Greek and Roman antiquity. So Homer, Sophocles, Thucydides, uh, Virgil, uh, uh, Homer, Catullus, and so forth. Um, and that's true. But that was only one part of the rebirth. There were a lot of other things going on. There were a lot of other rebirths, a lot of other rediscovery of texts that uh, caused people to think twice about religion. But first of all, let's just stick with the revival of, of the pagan classics, of, of the uh, classics of Greece and Rome, literary classics, which included, of course, the a new appreciation and revival of the uh, discipline of rhetoric. And uh, rhetoric, the art of persuasion, the art of making a good speech. This was applied now, bit by bit, in the Sistine Chapel to the sermons preached there between about 1750 and 1721. And I did a book on this. You could actually sort of use it as sort of a laboratory of a transition from medieval forms of preaching to this new form of preaching. So what was the new form that was adapted and adopted for the chapel in the, uh, during the Renaissance? It was the, technically speaking, the epideictic rhetoric or really the rhetoric of panegyric, the rhetoric of praise. So what are they going to praise? Well, panegyric, as you've all been to funerals and eulogies, you praise the deeds of the person that, who's died. Here, these sermons now focus on the great deeds of God. Uh, and the first great deed, of course, was creation. So God creating all things, and they were good. And then created the most perfect, the apex, you might say, of creation, which was the human being, the human person. Uh, created in the image and likeness of God. There was a wonderful book by Charles Trinkus many, many years ago called In Our Image and Likeness, which is about this whole uh, tradition. So it's a very positive appreciation of human nature. The second great mystery, no surprise, was the mystery of the incarnation. Uh, they were in awe. So epideictic rhetoric, pedagogic, it's not to try to solve a problem. It's not to sort of figure out what this is all about. As a matter of fact, it's to bow down before the mystery, but also to have your spirits lifted and your uh, uh, appreciation intensified for the great deed that's being done here. So what about this mystery of the incarnation? The incarnation. 
depictions of the visitation, of, of the Annunciation, of the birth of Christ, and so forth. It's all the incarnation. What is missing in all those frescoes in the Sistine Chapel? A figure, a picture, a panel on the crucifixion. There's no crucifixion seen in all those panels, panels of the life of Christ. Um, so at any rate, the, the incarnation is itself a redemptive act. Uh, the redemption took place in that moment. And as one of the preachers said so beautifully, in the virgin's womb, he kissed us and made us whole. kissed us, kissed our human nature, our human nature as such. So what I'm the only point I'm trying to make with this is that uh, there's a uh, humanism, but this is a, a, a broad human phenomenon for these people. It's not that just kissed uh, Christians, but kissed us, kissed our humanity, kissed us as human beings. So put that out there in the corner as one aspect of what's going on here in the Renaissance. The second thing, Come back to my question, my rebirth of what? Well, rebirth of all kinds of things. For one point, a rebirth of study of the Bible, especially the New Testament, again with Lorenzo Valla, beginning there in the middle of the 15th century, but then with, with Erasmus, 1516, publishing the first critical edition, uh, uh, Greek critical edition in the West of the New Testament, and then a new Latin translation. So, the New Testament. The uh, revival of the fathers of the church. So Erasmus, the great prince of the humanists, early 16th century, his great work, which we don't pay much attention to, is his many editions of the works of the fathers of the church, beginning in 1516 with his great monumental edition of, I think it's eight volumes, of the works of St. Jerome. Then he did the Greek, many of the Greek fathers, and, Origen, uh, Chrys Chrysostom, uh, Ambrose, and so forth of the West. So a revival of the fathers, but also a revival of pagan works of antiquity. Uh, Marsilio Ficino, priest in Florence, uh, whose patron was Cosimo dei Medici, uh, translated for the first time into Latin the complete works of Plato. Uh, although Platonism and Neoplatonism were immense influence during the Middle Ages and so forth, the West did not really have any uh, works of Plato in Latin translation. Therefore, Plato was just a figure out on the periphery, really, you might say, uh, although they knew he was important. So now for the first time, and this is now Plato as the devout philosopher, Pia Philosophia, a philosophy that's more devout than, than the pagan and secularizing Aristotle, which was especially at the University of Padua, it was a very secularizing Aristotle. So here in Plato, whom you probably didn't know this, Plato met Moses in, Europe, in Egypt, uh, and that's how he got to be so pious, you didn't know that. Did you know that? <laughs> anyway, this was one of the theories that sort of there's something going on here that is um, uh, beyond uh, the bounds of bounds of institutional bounds of Christianity. Also, Pacino published in Latin a number of in a volume on the Hermetic literature. That is the the works of Hermes Trismegistus, that mythical figure, who is a compilation of. Greek and Roman theosophy, uh, Greek and uh, Egyptian theosophy from the second and third century AD that professed to be an ancient philosophy going back. So the works of Orpheus the poet and uh, Zoroaster and so forth. So these, um, these pagan, these first theologians, Christian theology, the first theologians, early theologians, they under the poetic veil one can find religious truth and one can find the goodness of God, the oneness of God, the importance of personal purification and so forth. The line from Ficino that I think 
hits off his understanding best. She said it in one sentence. Una religio sub rituum diversitate. One religion under diversity of rights. One religion under diversity of forms. I'd like to mention another figure from the Renaissance besides Ficino. A man by the name of Egidio da Viterbo, died in 1532. I know Egidio well because I wrote my dissertation on him. <laughs> Giles of Viterbo, Egidio da Viterbo, who was the prior general of the Augustinian order in Rome, died in 1532, a great favorite of Pope uh, Julius II, Pope Leo X. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, a polymath, a, a very vigorous reformer of the Augustinian order in the years he was prior general, which was 1508 to 1518 when he became a cardinal. Uh, but also he was a polymath. And uh, among his uh, works, his intellectual interest was the Koran. Mm. So 1518, he had a Latin translation of the Quran made for himself with an, a, a, the Arabic text on the other side of the page. Uh, we have that manuscript, it's at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris right now. We don't know how much he used it, but he had it, shows his interest. Uh, also, he was, um, he was from Viterbo, which is old uh, Etruscan territory, Etruria. And uh, he believed in the forgeries of his compatriot, Anio da Viterbo, that uh, a son of Moses brought the revelation to Etruria. And therefore, the Etrurians had the uh, glimmer of the true religion and passed it on down through, uh, through the centuries into the, into the Romans. And his further curious interest was in the Kabbalah. Mm. And he became probably the greatest ex Christian ex student of the Kabbalah in the 16th century, much better than Pico and others that you hear so much about Reuchlin. Uh, he brought to his household in Rome Elijah Levita, this distinguished Jewish rabbi, an important Jewish rabbi. He and Elijah Levita and his family lived there with the Augustinians and somewhere in that Augustinian convent for about uh, seven or eight years. And uh, Elijah Levita taught Egidio Hebrew, and Egidio taught him Greek. Uh, and with that, Egidio's interest in the Kabbalah grew, that medieval Jewish theosophy, combination of numerology, Pythagoreanism, Neoplatonism, and so on and so forth, which purported to be a tradition, going back to antiquity, going back to Moses. So just as there was the written law of Moses, there was also this unwritten tradition that had been hidden for centuries from Christians, but now is being exposed. And here, too, Giles found, Egidio found the uh, mystery of the Trinity. He found all sorts of Christian truths. So, uh, and by, and Giles, interesting fact, I mean, Giles was encouraged in this pursuit by uh, Pope Clement VII, and he Made, Giles made a presentation of a book to Pope Clement VII of his Christian interpretation of the Kabbalah. Come back before leaving uh, these people to a statement by St. Antoninus of Florence, so mid 15th century, this highly respected Dominican Archbishop, St. Antoninus. What he had to say was Veritas, a cocumque dicator. A spiritu sancto est. If it is true, it is from the Holy Spirit, no matter who said it. Pretty interesting. So let's move out of Italy and out of some of this, these mental gymnastics that people there are using to try to find saving truth outside the normal boundaries and move north to Erasmus. Uh, I mentioned Erasmus's great contribution in terms of his uh, editions of the Fathers of the Church. One of his 
pedagogical techniques was the creation of these little colloquies to teach uh, students good Latin, but he also used them for further purposes. And many of them are satirical, they're very funny, uh, but he does have some that are quite serious. And my favorite, and I think his most sublime, is called The Godly Feast, Convivium Religiosum. And this is uh, set in a villa with a group of friends, devout Catholic, devout Christians, who come together for a meal and engage in this long conversation, this colloquy, or if you will, this dialogue, dialogue being a characteristic Renaissance form, dialogue about different matters and including religion. So let me just uh, read you two passages. So one of the speakers says, I think that I have never read anything in pagan writers more proper to the true Christian, true Christian than what Socrates spoke to Crito shortly before drinking the hemlock. Whether God will approve of my, quote, this is Socrates, whether God will approve of my works, he said, I know not, but I have tried hard to please him. Another member there replies, an admirable spirit, surely, in one who had not known Christ and the sacred scriptures. And so, when I read such things of such men, <laughs> I can hardly keep from exclaiming, O oh, Saint Socrates, pray for us. <laughs> First speaker, as for me, there are many times when I do not hesitate to hope confidently that the souls of Virgil and Horace are sanctified. A second passage. One of the speakers says, it's, it's okay, we're talking about the scriptures, it's okay now to, for me to introduce a, a, some, a pagan author, pagan subject, the reply. On the contrary, whatever is devout and contributes to goodness should not be called profane. Of course, Sacred scripture is the basic authority in everything. Yet sometimes I run across some ancient sayings of pagan writers, even the poets, so purely and reverently expressed and so inspired that I cannot help believing that their authors' hearts were moved by some divine power. And perhaps the spirit of Christ is more widespread than we understand. And the company of saints includes many not in our calendar. So I just present this as a good instance. This was a very delicate period in the history of Christian theology, Christian thought, it lasted about a half century. It got uh, bashed by the vicious Reformation, counter-Reformation controversies. It kind of got lost to history. But it's a sign of uh, what the Father Ward talked about, this, in, this impulse for inclusion, salvation as inclusive their attempts to get beyond this no salvation be out, be, uh, outside the church, somehow or other, to find a way. It's certainly not the kind of problem we face today, but th these people did face uh, a religious diversity that uh, they had not known before and trying to deal with it and come up with a solution. So, so that's my part one. <laughs> part two. Peter's legacy. First of all, scholarship. I think, and what I've been hearing today from others, or yesterday, is that the great problem religions face is religion itself. Uh, uh, to say you're religious is taking a risk. I don't like to say I'm Christian anymore because of the way that word has been identified. So the problem with religion is religion itself and then the problem of religious pluralism. I think what Peter has done, the first thing he's done has been to focus our attention, to call our attention, to put it in our face that this is the problem 
And this is the problem we must deal with, painful and difficult and so forth, though it is. It's a problem especially for Christianity, for a number of reasons which I need not go into here. So that's his first contribution, major contribution in terms of scholarship. The second is his method. Uh, experience. Experiencing reality and looking at reality. Looking at what's out there. And draw your conclusions from that. See what's there and let go of the web of inherited categories or whatever Professor Ward called it yesterday. Uh, I tell my students uh, just in reading texts, uh, what you want to find out is what's there, what's not there. And there's a process of purification, purification of what you think should be there, purification of what you want to be there, purification of what you've told should be there or is there. So in this case too, in this whole quest of Peter, it's a purification of memory and imagination. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a method, it's, it's basic. And it uh, seems to me that's the grounding of what Peter's doing. So that's the scholarship. Then Peter the person. Peter's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I think that uh, picture I passed around maybe suggests that he was fun. Uh, and that's important. Because fun means a sense of humor, which means a sense of incongruity, which means a sense of distinguishing uh, what's real, what's unreal, what's important, what's unreported, the joy of Peter. So. This sense of incongruity, this, this sensitivity then to what's out there is a sensitivity to the human and the humane. And I believe that you cannot be sensitive to the human and the humane unless you yourself are human and humane. Uh, so that method and person are almost identical, so closely interconnected, that uh, that's why Peter is so important, that's why he's so much fun, and that's why he's such a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, John. Well, it's also my great privilege to introduce William Lowe, who is an Associate Professor of Historical and Systematic Theology across town at the Catholic University of America. A member of the faculty there since 1973, Bill has focused on Christology and Soteriology in his teaching. At various times, he has served as Department Chair and Associate Dean and lived to tell the tale. Active in the Catholic Theological Society of America and the College Theology Society, Bill has served as president of the latter. In addition to numerous reviews and various book chapters, his articles have appeared in the Anglican Theological Review, the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, Hefrop Journal, Horizons, Living Light, and Theological Studies. His widely used college student's introduction to Christology has been translated into Portuguese, and he has co-edited two other books. Bill received his BA in Classics, Philosophy and French, and an MA in French from Fordham University, and a PhL from Loyola Seminary. He received his PhD from Marquette University. Please join me in welcoming William P. Lowe. Well, good afternoon. Here we are in the rump part of the day, so we'll try to keep people awake, I suppose. Huh? It's difficult. Um, it's obviously the occasion to recall the first time I heard of, not met, but just heard of Peter Fahn. There was a theology department at Catholic University. I wasn't in that department. We were otherwise organized. But 
they were searching for a replacement to handle the eschatology course for seminarians. And I heard that they had hired some fellow from the University of Dallas. Now, the University of Dallas has a robustly Thomist approach to reality. <laughs> and so my first thought on hearing that this Peter Fawn was joining our faculty as a colleague was perhaps to expect a conventional, if not downright conservative, new colleague. And so my thought was, oh dear. <laughs> well, oh dear indeed, huh? <laughs> um, Actually, my own comments this afternoon may bring that oh dear home to roost. It may bite me. Okay? So um, I want to focus and joust perhaps a bit with Peter, focusing on an article that he was kind enough, so it must be his most widely read and best known article that he was kind enough to uh, contribute to some graduate students who are putting together a book for me. So the title of the article, Peter's article, was Christ in the Many and Diverse Religions, an Interreligious Christology. So I have titled these comments, of which I hope to get through maybe a third, okay, mercifully, um, Interfaith Christology, Dogmatic Prolegomena. <laughs> okay, so let's try to think along as we go through this now, okay? So Peter is proposing an interfaith Christology. Its goal is to arrive at an enlarged and enriched understanding of the term Christ. How to do it? By critically correlating the Christian understanding of the term with, quote, concepts and images present in other religions that exhibits significant similarities or analogies with it. Everybody still awake? Okay, now the question then immediately arises, on what basis can these similarities or functional analogies between the Christian understanding and these other images and concepts, how do you find those? <coughs> Peter turns to Christian usage and citing a typology of pre-modern Christologies, he goes on to say that, quote, underlying all these divergent Christologies is the notion that somehow in Jesus, somehow, however his historical role is interpreted, humans are given the possibility of fulfilling their nature and reaching their ultimate goal. I think there's a valuable insight in here. The image of the Messiah or Christ was a fit vehicle for early Christian faith precisely because of the heuristic character Peter assigns it. That is to say, Messiah in its original historical context developed into a culture-specific symbol that evoked Jewish hopes for the one through whom God would, putting it non-technically, make everything okay. Fulfillment, salvation, whatever, okay? So applied to Jesus, that symbol both articulates the significance his followers found in him. He's the one. And it also leaves open, somehow in Jesus, Peter writes, leaves open the question of how that hope was fulfilled in Jesus as something to be, be determined through the narratives they would then compose. At this point, Peter makes an interesting move, noting that in the Christian narrative context, it's at divine initiative and by divine power that Jesus fulfills his messianic function and that Christians identify the source of that power as the spirit of God, Peter suggests that his interfaith Christology be prefaced with an interfaith pneumatology, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the spirit. Okay, from a Christian viewpoint, I think that this suggestion corresponds to a shorthand genetic account of 
Christian faith. It is by the Spirit one is moved to recognize Jesus as Messiah and way to the Father. From the viewpoint of Peter's project, he finds it advantageous to begin with pneumatology because, he says, the spirit not being tied to a particular historical individual, it's easier to find analogies to the spirit in non-Christian religions. Okay, that assertion might occasion a little discussion, not tied to any particular individual. Huh? At any rate, one more observation about this article, and then a couple of questions. So we shall joust. Okay. Early on, in rehearsing the ground rules for authentic interfaith dialogue, Peter insists on the need to understand your partners on their own terms. And this requires regarding other religions not simply as paths to the same summit, God, or merely diverse cultural expressions of the same core experience. He says that's a no-no. Okay. So I think this comment alludes to a very common, if perhaps inadequate, typology of Christian approaches to other religions. As the typology goes, exclusive. We're the one, they're all superstitious religion of demons and so on. Huh? <coughs> or inclusive, they've got some good things, but we bring it all to fulfillment, or pluralistic, and that's that last, I think pluralistic is the one he has just excluded. They're all basically paths up the mountain to the same peak, something like that. At this point, a question occurs to me. In the article, Peter suggests as a prototype of his project one Raymond Ponycar, interesting, interesting thinker, okay? And I wonder though whether Peter's stricture against a common core experience is honored at least by Ponycar. The stricture rules out the notion of the religions as merely diverse cultural expressions of the same core religious experience. Panikar, central to his thought, Peter writes, is his belief that every being, and especially every human being, is a Christophany, that is the divinization of humanity, which is the other side of the humanization of God. And so my question is this, when Panikar claims that his Advaita Christology is shared by Jesus and all human beings, is he proposing something like a universal core religious experience? Question. I'm ignorant of these matters. <laughs> hey, I really am. Okay, just a couple more questions about this proposal. It seeks a profound and diverse understanding of the Christ on the basis of, among all the religions, the most varied and contradictory affirmations on what makes a being the Christ. Okay, a profound and diverse understanding of the Christ. I'm prompted to ask what Christ is being understood. Is it anything over and above the varied contradictory manners in which different religions envision the human situation, etc.? What's its referent? Does interfaith Christology have a referent? Panikar certainly seems to. Second question, this is a real question. In order to construct an interfaith Christology, once you've discerned similarities and analogies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these are to be critically correlated. Okay, critical correlation would imply some normative moment. And so I would ask whence that norm would be derived. Perhaps globalization is now raising in a new form the problem that historical consciousness raised for the Christian West, big time. Third, I can see if how Christ is taken in this purely heuristic sense, that which fulfills and solves the problem of evil. 
I can see how that can per promote mutual understanding among adherents of different religions. I would ask whether the term Christ is necessary to that end. Peter would seem to say that it is not when he recognizes that adherents of other religions might pursue an interfaith Buddhology, Krishnology, etc., just as, quote, Christians speak of interfaith Christology. So there seems to be a tension here between a specifically Christian project and one that is truly interfaith. Fourth, if you move beyond the heuristic sense into specific similarities and analogies with concepts and images found in other religions. I see, as per Peter urges, that Christian self-understanding can be enhanced. But this is a gain of what Peter has termed dialogical Christologies as distinct from an interfaith Christology. And so also, that more substantive move can enhance the intelligibility of Christian faith to non-Christian believers. And Peter cites Panikkar to this effect. If Christ is to have any meaning for Hindus, Andines, Igbos, Vietnamese, and others who do not belong to the Abrahamic lineage, this meaning can no longer be offered in the garb of Western philosophies. There's an ambiguity in this statement. In the context of Christian missionary endeavors, it affirms the necessity of enculturation. And that necessity raises the perennial issue of hermeneutics to a whole new notch. And Panikkar seems to imply this missionary motive if Christ is to have any meaning. I mean, to whom is it a concern that Christ have meaning outside of the Christian context? That missionary intent, however, would be foreign to the project of an interfaith Christology, which seeks mutual understanding to be achieved by constructing a concept, a concept that operates, Peter specifies, on the level of intelligibility while bracketing truth claims. This suggests a final question. Peter suggests that what's at stake in this interfaith Christology is strictly a matter of understanding, of intelligibility. And to make the point, he, with incense, okay, he cites Bernard Lonergan on the distinction between doctrines and systematics. But he also ventures that such a Christology may be deemed theologically inappropriate or even heterodox from the viewpoint of Christian orthodoxy. So my question is, how do these two affirmations cohere? Orthodoxy concerns judgments, doctrines, as opposed to intelligibilities. Hmm? Nor is it faith how, clear how interfaith dialogue and mutual understanding would be promoted if you arrived at an interfaith Christology in which Christian participants could not recognize something of their own self-understanding. So there seems to be a tension at Peter's point, <coughs> proposal at this point. Okay, Peter is up front when he acknowledges the programmatic, tentative, and exploratory character of his proposal. As he says, this project is in its infancy, and the proof will lie in the pudding. Now, he wrote this a couple of years ago. He may have figured it all out by now, too. Huh? Okay. So it may be that these questions that the proposal evokes may find solution. Meanwhile, I think I'll stop here. It's been 15 minutes. Okay. As a theologian woefully unschooled in other religious traditions, and unpracticed in dialogue. I appreciate the virtuosity of Peter's imaginative, groundbreaking thinking outside the box. So I could go on to talk about pneumatology and its promise, and then I could go on to say how the Council of Chalcedon solves the whole thing, but um, perhaps <laughs> that's enough for now. Anyway. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much indeed, Bill. Uh, well, last and certainly not least, it's my great pleasure to introduce my great colleague and friend, Leo Lefebure, who is the Matteo Ricci SJ Professor of Theology here at Georgetown. He's also a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago. Leo is the author of many books, including True and Holy, Christian Scripture and Other Religions, which received the Catholic Press Association first prize in 2015 for Best Academic Book on Scripture. Leo is also the co-author with Peter Feltmeyer of The Path of Wisdom, a Christian commentary on Adamapada. His other books include Revelation, The Religions and Violence, The Buddha and the Christ, and Towards a Contemporary Wisdom Christology, a study of Karl Rana and Norman Pittinger. Lefebure is an honorary research fellow of the Chinese University of Hong Kong and a trustee emeritus of the Council for the Parliament of the World's Religions. Leo obtained his STL from St. Mary of the Lake Seminary and his PhD from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Please join me in welcoming Leo Lefebvre. Thank you. I trust you are all familiar with the tale of the blind person feeling an elephant from different angles and coming up with very different descriptions of what kind of creature this is. Now, I do not know if this elephant is a relative of our Peter fan. <laughs> but I do know that the dilemma is the same. <laughs> Keith Ward can pronounce whether this counts as a Wittgensteinian family resemblance or not. <laughs> Depending on what angle we approach Fan Din Cho, we find very different creatures. We've already heard many of the different contributions of Peter. A couple years ago, I set up a lunch between two friends, a Catholic scholar from Belarus, and a Bulgarian Orthodox scholar from Sofia, Bulgaria. And so we're having an active lunch discussion. To be honest, these two scholars don't care that much about most of the things we've talked about in this conference. But they revered the name of Peter Fan because of his early work on Russian Orthodoxy and his building bridges between the iconographical vision of Paul Evdokimov and the Catholic tradition on eschatology. Peter was drawn to Evdokimov as a fellow exile who fled the revolution in Russia and then lived betwixt and between in different places, landing finally in Paris. And in assessing Evdokimov's vision of theology and culture, Peter stressed the importance of the Imago Dei in all humans and in Jesus Christ and the role of the Holy Spirit, the liturgy and icons in shaping religious and cultural life. Not to mention the importance of Dostoevsky. Because icons are transparent to the infinite, the divine, they make present already here and now the eschatological fulfillment. After summarizing each aspect of Paul Evdokimov's theology, Peter sought to build a bridge between Orthodox and Catholic theologies that had for too many centuries been in conflict. So Peter's first contribution was to be a pioneer in improving Catholic-Russian Orthodox relations. So in a sense, I'd like to suggest Peter started his career by taking up the most difficult relationship. <laughs> Then he went on to the easier ones and interreligious difficulties. <laughs> Peter, I have to let you know we've got trouble with the Russians. <laughs> we need you to come back to this. <laughs> but in this discussion of people discovering this creature, Fan Din Cho, somebody else objects, no, 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 you're talking about the wrong person. Peter Fan is an important scholar of Karl Rahner. Everything he writes is informed by Rahner's sense of holy mystery in time and eternity. It's all reductio in mysterium. Everything that he writes is within a Rahnerian context. So Peter brought his knowledge of the Russian Orthodox tradition to the study of eschatology in Karl Rahner, where he found a sense of holy mystery in relation to the unfathomable mystery of the human person. In a way that complements Orthodox perspectives, Rahner learned from, or Peter learned from Rahner that we are, each of us, an act of reaching out for more, for a reality greater than we can possibly imagine or grasp. But then another voice interrupts, no, 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 no. Peter Fan is the world's leading expert on Alexandre de Rode, the noted 17th century missionary to Vietnam, who related Catholic faith to Vietnamese culture. 
And as this voice is trying to elaborate, somebody else exclaims, no, no, no. Peter Fan is a scholar of the fathers of the early church. He edited a volume of patristic writings on grace and the human condition, and then another one on social thought. But then the other person chimes in, no, no, no. He's from Southeast Asia. You always have to keep this in mind. Peter shares his culture's concern for our relationship with our deceased loved ones. And so Peter published a commentary on pastoral guidelines for prayers for the dead. Plus another book that answers 101 of your questions about the afterlife. <laughs> I suppose you have to pay him extra for the 102nd question. <laughs> In considering the relation of the eschatological state to this world, Peter proposes a vision of continuity and discontinuity. Or, he tells us more exactly, more discontinuity than continuity. Now, if you want to know what that means, to demonstrate what this means, you can look in America Magazine, where you can find an ad personally guided tour of the afterlife with Peter Fan. <laughs> reduced price. <laughs> no, but there's a catch. He's saying reduced price. But see, I repeatedly asked him about the details of the return trip. <laughs> Anybody can take you to the afterlife. The trick is to bring you back. <laughs> then another scholar, another of our explorers intervenes. No, 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 no. Peter Fan is a scholar of Catholicism in Asia. He's written on the work of the Federation of Asian Bishops' Conferences and the Asian Synod. He's a trailblazer of Asian American Christian theology. He's taken up the challenge of FABC to reflect upon the many aspects of religious identity in a world of the many poor, the many cultures, the many religions. He's an active participant in dialogues with Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Taoists, and Confucianists. At the last Parliament of the World's Religions, he invited his friend Rabbi David Gordas to join us in a triadic Christian-Buddhist-Jewish conversation. And just in February, he and I were in Kyoto for another triadic conversation, this time among Buddhists, Muslims, and Christians. So Peter's always reaching out to others. You may recall that once upon a time, somebody else was given the name Peter. And then later on, that other Peter got the reputation for being a Pontifex, even a Pontifex Maximus, a bridge builder, literally, even the greatest bridge builder. I propose to you that our Peter is a Pontifex in pectore, <laughs> a builder of bridges in the heart. The reason we build bridges is that what unites us lies deep below the surface and we need a way to cross over. And this is Peter's constant concern, to build bridges in the heart so that we may cross over. This is at the heart of what Peter means when he talks about missio inter gentes, to build bridges. In light of his life journey, it's not surprising that Peter became a pioneer in the theology of migration, attending to people who leave their homeland especially those who are pushed out. Dietrich Bonhoeffer taught us that God allows God's self to be pushed out of this world, and Peter shares this perspective and the concern for those who are pushed out of their homes. From this perspective, I suggest the climax of Peter's career came a year ago with his presidential address to the American Theological Society, in which he reflected on the holy mystery, Deus Migrator Est. God is a migrant. God has written, er, <laughs> Peter has written more. more <laughs> I told you it was going to be hagiographical. That's, that's coming later. Uh, Peter has written more books and articles and edited more works than I can count, including books on the Trinity, the Asian Senate, Christianities in Asia, Christianities in Migration, American Christian Diversity, many, many others. So these multiple identities offer too much to take in. In his writings, particularly about the difficulties with the magisterium, Peters evoked the classic scholastic distinction that was so emphasized by Bernard Lonergan between quidsit and onsit. What is it? Is it so? But to study Peter's countless contributions, I think, Peter, we need a third level of questioning. 
quat sint. Mm -hmm. How many are there? When Posidius was concluding his biography of Augustine of Hippo, he pointed out that surely one individual alone would never have time to read all of his works. So how could one person have possibly written them all? So this is like what Gerard was suggesting. Quat sint. How many Peters are there? So I'm not sure anybody's going to have time to read everything that he's read and edited, let alone to have written it. Now, the mystery of Peter's plural identity begins with his birth. Most of us enter the world once and have one birthday. <laughs> but Peter's father arranged for him to be born on two different occasions and was able to produce government documents proving he was born twice in two different years. Now, earlier today, we all heard Peter make a clear distinction between reality and the physical. <laughs> so you can have two births without it being physical. So this allowed... Peter from a very young age to be older than he was. So that he could edit a program in Vietnam ahead of his time, in a sense be wiser than his age would allow him to be. Now I do not pr pretend to understand the mystery of his twofold origin. And I am not going to speculate on whether his dual birth evokes the mystery of the dual origins of the two natures of Jesus Christ. <laughs> but surely this dual origin of Peter offers us a mystery to ponder. Now we all know Peter insists Christology has to be grounded in Trinitarian theology. He says this over and over again and again and again. So Peter was not satisfied with this mystery of the dual origin. He wasn't satisfied with one doctorate. We know Germans think one has to do two doctorates to be taken seriously. For some reason, Peter found it necessary to do three. My suspicion is this was in competition with Ramon Panikar, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so while remaining one undivided essence, the economic Peter Fan revealed himself in three different <laughs> academic personae through his doctoral works on Paul Evdokimov, Karl Rahner, and Alexandre de Rohan. Now again, I will not speculate on how Peter shares in the life of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. But in this triadic self-manifestation, we find yet another mystery worthy of our consideration. And this all, of course, led into his lifelong study of the Holy Trinity. Peter insists on grounding theology and human experience. And his contributions are shaped by the many distinctive angles of vision, because since his youth, he's had a hard time staying in one place for very long. He grew up in Vietnam, studied first in French at a French school where he learned all about French history, geography, wines, and escargot, but nothing about Vietnamese history or culture. <laughs> then he went to an island near Hong Kong where he studied Western scholastic philosophy without learning anything about Chinese philosophy and religion. Now we visited this island a year ago after the conference in Hong Kong, and it was really wonderful for me to see Peter reminiscing about the various figures of his early life in the same buildings where he spent a number of years. After further studies in Rome, during the years after the Second Vatican Council, he returned to Vietnam. Now at this period of his life, it was not at all in his expectations to become the inaugural Ignacio E. Correa Chair of Social Thought at Georgetown University, but one day his life changed. One Sunday morning, instead of doing his usual routine of celebrating mass for women in a prison, Peter was relaxing over a late leisurely breakfast at the very time the government of South Vietnam was collapsing. One of his sisters raced up and told him quite abruptly that his family members were leaving the country and they wanted him to join them. He raced off on his motorcycle, saw some beggars, stopped, and to their complete amazement, he hurriedly gave away all his Vietnamese money. I propose to you that this dramatic scene captures Peter's central lesson to all of us. This is the link between eschatology and migration. When the world as we know it is coming to an end, 
when the old assumptions and expectations no longer apply, when no one knows what is going to happen next, when there's no security anywhere, the proper response is to be generous, to give away all that you have to someone else who might be able to use it better than you. When Peter writes about kenosis, this is what it looks like. Peter's generosity with his time, his talents, and his treasure overflows beyond measure. Peter's parents gave him the personal name Cho, and they were hoping that it would characterize his future life. Cho in Vietnamese means to give. Peter, on behalf of all of us, I dare say their hopes have been fulfilled. After giving away all his money, Peter went home to retrieve a change of clothes, found his family, and after much hassle, found himself on an airplane with his family without having any idea where they were going. When he left his homeland, he had with him just a change of clothing. He left behind even his licentiate research paper on Paul Tillich, another refugee who fled his homeland. <coughs> where do we find God? Deus migrator est. We find God among those who are pushed out of the world. But not only was Peter a refugee from the conflicts in his beloved Vietnam, when he first came to the United States, he began his working career as a collector of garbage, working for a man whom Peter called Mr. 210, because this man paid his workers the minimum wage, which was $2.10 at that time. Though Peter probably did not realize it at this time, this experience would give Peter what Gustavo Gutierrez calls a hermeneutical privilege, an angle of vision denied to most theologians. Years later, as Brian Flanagan reminded us, Peter would write about the magisterium of the poor as having a distinctive wisdom to teach both the magisterium of the bishops and that of theologians. In making this claim, Peter, more than just about any other academic theologian I knew, I know, knew what he was talking about. He had worked as a collector of garbage. I dare suggest in the long history of Christian theology, there's no other collector of garbage who's contributed so much to theological scholarship as Peter Fan. When Peter writes about consulting the wisdom of the poor, he far more than most academic theologians knows firsthand what he's writing about. He knows the cries of poor refugees who were cast out of their homes and who earn a living by handling what others throw away. He knows how different those challenges are from those of the rich and the comfortable. The many twists and turns of his life have given Peter a strong appreciation for the contingency the unpredictability of life, for its undeserved sufferings and blessings. And he describes himself as an accidental theologian. So after his unexpected arrival in the US, he went one day to the University of Dallas, hoping to apply for a doctoral program in philosophy. And so they welcomed him and announced him as their new instructor in theology. <laughs> so he did his doctorate on Evdokima. There are some scholars who are like archaeologists, who find an unexplored site and dig and dig and dig ever deeper into it. Peter could have done this kind of career, but instead he was restless and chose to be more like a satellite orbiting the Earth and turning its gaze from one area to another. Peter makes repeated contributions through his ability to make connections among different peoples, different religions, different cultures. But after orbiting the Earth, he comes back down to the surface to build bridges. To fil facilitate crossing boundaries, Peter has a lifelong interest in hermeneutics. In the programmatic work of Latin hermeneutics, the De Doctrina Christiana, 
Augustine of Hippo reflects on the relation between signs and realities and gives many pointers for interpreting the Bible. But at the end of this discussion, Augustine tells us, the preacher's lifestyle carries more weight than his style of oratory. For us to be listened to with obedient compliance, whatever the grandeur of the speaker's utterances, his manner of life carries more weight. The greatest contribution Peter has given us is the life he has lived. Again, symbolized for me in that moment of giving away all his money to the beggar in Vietnam. So we find an accidental theologian who's always betwixt and between. What happens by accident? In the morning of my ordination, my brother, who's a published poet, gave me some verses by San Juan de la Cruz, St. John of the Cross, which I suggest evokes something of our encounter with Peter and his contribution to us. Por toda la hermosura, nunca yo me perderé, sino por un no sé qué, que se alcanza por ventura. For all the beauty there may be, I'll never lose my soul. Only for something I don't know that one may come on randomly. Encontremos Pedro por ventura. We meet this accidental theologian for Ventura. Accidentally, for a venture, for an adventure. By accident, randomly, perhaps by providence, by grace. This migrant refugee from his homeland washed up on the shore where our paths have crossed. He began to build bridges and became a pontifex in pectore and our lives are forever changed. We find ourselves together with Peter as companions on a journey, a migration into un no se que, que se alcanza por ventura. In Peter's life, we come into contact with a mystery we do not know, that we encounter, as it were, by accident. Peter is a restless wanderer, never satisfied with what he has accomplished, but always heading for another destination. And so I think we need to teach him one important word in Hebrew. He may have heard this said in his presence, but I'm not sure it fully ever registered with him. As Jews celebrate the archetypal migration of the Exodus, at one point in the middle of the Seder service, they pause for a moment of reflection and thanksgiving for the marvel of what they are in the middle of. And they sing a bright, lively song, Dayenu, it would have been enough for us. And they list the various works that God has performed after each one explaining, if God had done only this for us and nothing else, it would have been enough for us. And then another line, if God had done only this for us and nothing else, it would have been enough for us. I think it's incumbent upon all of us here today to teach Peter this word in Hebrew, telling him dayenu even if he had offered us only a small portion of his lifelong contributions, it would have been enough for us. Peter Dayenu. indeed Leo and thanks once again to John and to Bill that was a wonderful final panel now I'm not going to introduce our final speaker of today because to paraphrase um, Peter himself when he once introduced John and Mally at a conference on Vatican II a couple of years ago if you don't know who Peter Fan is by now that's your problem <laughs> there's a lot of people who wanted to be here, and we wanted them to be here, but who could not be here for various reasons. And they send Peter their very best wishes and regards. Uh, I'll probably forget some of them, but just to name a few, they include Roger Hayden from Union Theological Seminary. They include uh, Elizabeth Johnson from Fordham University, Jim Corridan of the Catholic University of America, Mark Chapman of Oxford University, Agnes Brazal of St. Thomas University in Manila in the Philippines, Darren Diaz, Jerry Skira, and Michael Attridge of the University of Toronto. 
the Canadian guys say they're actually planning to honour you themselves next year, so not only might you end up with free doctorates, you might end up with free festerists. <laughs> one dear friend of many of ours from Germany has asked me to um, read out a message that he sent you. This is the Serbian Orthodox scholar Vladimir Latinovich, who teaches at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Dear Peter, since I was prevented to participate in celebration of the Fan Day Festival in person, so I thought I could express my deepest respect for you with this message. It is truly a great honour to know you as a scholar, great joy to have you as a friend, and great luck not to have you as an enemy. <laughs> you are a lousy Catholic theologian, but you are a great theologian. You do not fit in any box, but the range of topics you covered during your theological career can fill many boxes, and I am sure there is plenty to come. The Chair of Theology of the University of Oxford, Johannes Zachhuber, once mispronounced your name as Peter Pan, <laughs> which is probably a Freudian slip. <laughs> but the freshness of your thought, the rebellious nature of your theology, for which on many occasions you suffered consequences, and the magic of your expression, always followed by the humorous remarks, makes you a theologian that wouldn't grow up. And by all means, I mean this as a compliment. Grown-ups are usually boring, and that is one thing that you are most definitely not. <laughs> Finally, I wish to add something as an orthodox theologian and as a patristic scholar. Peter, I wish they elected you as the next pope. That would not only secure Francis's legacy, but it would also be great to finally have a bishop of Rome with the name Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, I congratulate you and the Georgetown University for having uh, this occasion, and I pray for your good health so that you can give us more excellent books and articles, and of course, jokes. Your friend, Vladimir. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Fan. Well, that was late, so I'll be very short. Um, um, one of my students uh, at the University of Dallas went to Innsbruck to visit Colonel Runner at the time. And he came to the room and saw all the books lining all the wall. He said, Professor Runner, have you read all this? I'm the Island Runner said, no, I have not read it. I wrote them. <laughs> <laughs> well, where's Leo? All right, Leo, you mentioned that I was a garbage collector two thousand and an hour, which is absolutely true. But three, went to, three year, months later, I got a job teaching theology at the University of Dallas, and three years later, I was made chair of the department. People who know me say, oh, Peter, what an honor. You move from garbage collector <laughs> to being a professor of theology. I said, there is no difference. <laughs> <laughs> it's what I collected, and now I just gave it. <laughs> so that's what you get for all the books, 30 something books and 300 articles, that's the garbage but no longer and to at two dollars test an hour. George starts I mean much better than that. <laughs> um, one of the uh, things my friend Linda Stinson says to me, so I have to say, what brings you here today? What is the reason for your being here? Well, I tell you one thing. One of the worst things that the Vatican has done to me the CDF has come to me. It's not to question my orthodoxy or, or lack of it, but it forced me to reread my writings. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst thing. You can read your own books, but you know it, forget it. You don't put it in there. And it forced me to reread my books. I said, oh shit, did I say that? <laughs> Did I wrote that? <laughs> and that is exactly what I have been hearing the last yesterday today. <laughs> to hear all those people attribute to me all those ideas. And all that. <laughs> Shit, 
did. I have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. It's a great sense of humility for me to sit there for yesterday and today to listen to splendid papers to say, my God, is that what I have done? And, you know, this is just a great uh, sense of gratitude for me after so many years to have you here to talk about what I have done, but above all, what I need to do. Thank you very much for those four questions, Bill, and I will answer them eventually. <laughs> but I'd like to, first of all, to thank Georgetown University. If I hadn't come here in 2003 and had stayed on at Cass University, I might, I certainly have fa uh, faced the same problem and problem and issues as Charlie. You know, Charlie was sent away from Catholic University in 2000, uh, 1087, right? 86, 87. If I had stayed on at Georgetown University, I would have faced the same thing. But Georgetown offered me a home. One year before it happened, divine providence worked marvelous way. <laughs> so I was here, and this morning somebody told me, uh, the day I got a letter, I usually throw away all correspondence that come from the chancery. <laughs> I had no interest whatsoever in anything come from the bishop store. <laughs> and I look at it and say, oh my god, that's a big emblem. <laughs> and I better look at it. So I reached into the round <laughs> fire and opened it. So, oh my god. Sacra Congregazione per la Doctrina de la Fede, CDF. My hand shaking. And I just flipped through it. Seven pages, 19 observations. First thing, I went to see Chet. He was the chair of the department. He said, Chet, sit down. I said, what happened? I just showed him. He looked at it. He said, I repeated, shit, Peter, you are in hard trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Next, I went to the dean. He was here this morning. Uh, Jane McCauley. I said, Jane, she's very cool. You know her. She's absolutely cool. She looked at it. It's OK. Fine. Nothing said. So I gave to, finally, I went out to the President's office. I gave to President the joy. He said nothing. I said, Professor Pan, you are a tenured professor here. That's it. The only he said. Charlie, that is the reason why I'm so, I was so calm. Because they, I knew then that CDF couldn't get me. Because the president of the university assure me that this is our academic institution. So I thank Georgetown. But I also thank the one who represents Georgetown most today is our dear, dear Vice President Tom Badger. What you said yesterday was a text that I will use for my eventual canonization. <laughs> <laughs> so I will frame it, I will send it to Rob, just in case they declare me sovereign of God, beatified, and canonized. Here's the fact. Probably the Tom Banchoff has said it all. The Pope has no need to add anything more. Uh, let me begin by thanking the people who are near here. John Borelli, you are younger than I am. <laughs> And it shows, <laughs> because you are less wise and less holy than I am. <laughs> it shows, all right? He's my dear friend. He is always called me the older brother. I put the emphasis on the word older, so that he looks younger. But, you know, your head and mine are very much the same. <laughs> Chester Gill is not here, but he was the chair of the department. The one thing good he has done in his life is to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> David Hollenbach, 
My God, you and I walk in so many. Now you are president of Catholic Theological Society of America. We are so proud of your work on migration, on human rights, and we try to seduce you eventually to the part of theology. Okay, but that is secret. <laughs> but we are, we are so, a secret. <laughs> we, we are so proud of you, dear. We want to come to Georgetown. Thank you for your work, and I will be with you next year in Princeton on the issues of migration. Alan Mitchell. If you want to know anything about the letter of the Hebrew, that's a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I will write to the Holy See asking for my royalty <laughs> because I am the writer of the letter of the Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. He and I, if you want to know anything about the Bible, that's the guy. New Testament. And if you don't want anything about right wing Catholicism, also the guy. He knows every online gossip about all those right wing. So he and I share together. Every time in pastor his office, I say, Alan, what is the latest? So he would tell me all the news about right wing Catholic. <laughs> Julia Lamb. I mean, if you want to know anything about Schleiermacher, I do not know whether you want to know anything, but if you <laughs> about Schleiermacher, that's the woman, the scholar you go to, besides being the wife of Alan Mitchell, the bed to have. I often wonder, I said, Alan, what had you done to deserve Julia? A wonderful scholar, wonderful friend, and such a wonderful department of men. Jose Casanova, the one thing I like about you <laughs> is he can talk for three hours non-stop, no notes, and he can tell people to speak English with a Spanish accent. <laughs> I can tell whether sometimes, are you speaking Spanish? Are you speaking English? Just people ask me, are you speaking Vietnamese? Are you speaking <laughs> So he and I are symbols of accented English, Vietnamese and Spanish. But if you want to know anything at all about secularization and globalization, that is Mr. Globalization and, and, and so, Thank you so much. And he and I worked together in this uh, three years program uh, of globalization as a Catholic. <coughs> the other person uh, is not here, but Dan Madigan. Uh, he was supposed to be here. He's uh, from Australia. Very relaxed. He taught me how to go slow. Everything <laughs> slow. But uh, his health is no good. So I asked to pray for him. Uh, he's a wonderful scholar on Islam and uh, a scholar on the uh, Quran, but uh, Islam and, and, and Catholic Christianity dialogue. What do I say about Leo Lefebvre? Oh my gosh. One thing, if you travel and you tend to get lost, you don't have any direction where to go, go with Leo. <laughs> Leo knows where to go. So I was in Japan with him at Kyoto. I got lost. I said, never mind. He will be the guy. So if I am a bridge builder, you are the guy, the tour guy of uh, extreme, uh, 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 very reliable guys. But besides that, he has one common thing with Pope Benedict XVI. One thing only. <laughs> He's a classical pianist. You never know that. But someday he will perform for you. But that's the only thing coming between him and him. <laughs> <laughs> John Amani. The only thing I would like to tell you is this. When I grow up, I would like to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> I am not kidding. I had, you know, the practice of visiting the Blessed Sacrament, right? Daily World Blessed Sacrament. His office is always open. Every day is 8 o'clock to find his office. 
the door open, and every day I come in, I kneel down like that, <laughs> and I say, I pay my visit to the place itself. <laughs> and sometimes I don't show up, he says, Oh, the Blessed Sacrum has been feeling so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> but he never knows. I like to tell you the secret, John. I come not to visit you. Because, but, because the opposite of your office is the men's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, I give two bubble and stove. I always come to say hello to you because... <laughs> Let me go to my father from Georgetown, everybody from Georgetown. <laughs> I'd like to thank William Law. Been here for a long time, 15 years with you at Georgetown. And I am so grateful for the four questions you raised. You read very carefully the, the essays. And I surely, I, I am trying to think outside the box, as you said. But when you think outside the box, there are a lot of questions that have no immediate answer. What is Christ? Is that a reference to Christ? How you will? I will, in my spare time, I will answer those four questions. I hope to your satisfaction. But thank you so much for showing up here. And we have been so long uh, together. Ryan Doyle from across town. He was my doctoral student at George R. Cathy University. And I tell you, he's one of the brightest Dedicated B plus student. <laughs> oh, no. oh no, oh no. Uh, I gave a lecture, I gave a lecture at, at the, they gave me an uh, ethics award, you know, huge one. And I said, what reason for giving that ethics award to me? The only reason it is you have been keeping yourself out of prison for a long time. <laughs> but I begin by saying he is one of my best students. Best why? Because he can move from D to D plus <laughs> to A and give courage a God to his own students. So thank you very much, Brian. And of course, Brian Flanagan. Uh, we met with the, uh, we had no connection in terms of uh, student teacher and so forth, but we have been together in so many places at CZ, and we never left the bar before three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so great, right? Let me go. Look what father, much father, and I thank them for taking the time to be here. And John, who is my doctoral student here, and his dissertation will be published very soon by Oxford University Press. Mm -hmm. 500 and something pages. Mm -hmm. So, so congratulations. Right Maximum right now, allow 130,000 words. Okay, good, <laughs> thank you. So, great. Jonathan Tom is here too. He's my doctoral student at Akashi University, and now he's a now chair professor, so seeing how wonderful they are. And he's a great authority on Asian theology himself. And I learned so much about his lecture this morning, this online transitory migrant community. As I said, I confess to you, I have no face, no book. But after this, neither face nor book, but after this, I think I have to think something about going to online. There are so many, many years now. We met 13, 14, 15 years ago, working together on that volume, Christianity, a Christian movement. And ever since we all spent time together, he came down to stay with me, with us, and then we go on vacation together. But you talk about me, talk about world Christianity. Anything I know about world Christianity, I love from that guy. So please, I'm so all the credit to me to Dale Irving. He's the source of all knowledge on migration and global. Uh, and so, Christina, the only Asian person here from the Philippines. I was in the Philippines two weeks ago with Jose Casanova. Everybody knows who Christina Astorga is. You are a great uh, uh, 
shall we say, the next piece of fan? Great. Finally, from far abroad. Keith Ward, I have to say to you that I have an almost complete collection of your works. <laughs> Ten books. Now, I bought them before eBay and <laughs> Amazon.com. I pay full price for those nice books. Now, I wonder if I went to eBay uh, on, on Amazon.com. I saw my book for one cent. <laughs> so I had the five copies of it, one cent. Of course, to pay three ninety nine dollars <laughs> you know. But oh my God, I pay full price so your royalties in those years must come from my book. <laughs> I am still missing your latest second three, two or three books. It costs about hundred dollars. <laughs> So, okay, so I will Xerox them for my own year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. And we'll be together on May the 18th at uh, Virginia Theological Seminary, where he will give the comments of address and where Peter Pan will receive his honorary doctorate of divinity. Wow. Oh, nice. Nice, right. <laughs> Deborah Tonelli? We met, we were in Assisi, we were in Hong Kong, we were here last two years ago. I mean, that woman expert in politics and Old Testament. I mean, thinking of those languages you have to learn, besides Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and Latin, and of course Italian, and now you have to learn one more language to be really, really complete. Vietnamese. <laughs> everybody, I think everybody, but before I thank everybody, I thank all of you who spend time here this today. You could have done much better by doing something else. <laughs> you have done better than to do that here. But to here because you love Georgetown, you love the people here, and you love, you know, hearing something new about theology. So, so thank you so much for your time, my dear friends. I can't remember them all, uh, but uh, i like to thank you first. The last person. <laughs> Jeremiah. Without whom that which has happened will never have happened. a man of Irish <laughs> volubility, <laughs> a man of amazing organizational ability, a man who can attract the widest scholars all over the world to come together to share a theological conversation. Only Gerard Manning can do that. We are very blessed at Georgetown, not only because he's a scholar, and, uh, but his ability to bring people together, talk about building bridges. He building highways and byways <laughs> and all kinds of underground everywhere to bring us together. And so I am very grateful, uh, Gerard, uh, for this uh, organization. Who else? I thank everybody. Oh, one more. Charlie Charlie Cullen, I did mention already, right? Yeah. I did mention Charlie. One more person. Oh, that is the role that man is. The one person? God. <laughs> ah, well. Many of us talk, talk about absolute mystery, infinite mystery. But ultimately, as a theologian, that's only reality to work. 
And so in thanking God and the people that needed God to my life and my work, I like to use a song of John uh, Denver. He died young. I listen to him all the time. <laughs> and his song is entitled Poems, Prayers, and Promises. Please Google John Denver Poems, Prayers, and Promises. That's the best summary for me of what theology is. Mm -hmm. Poems. Without imagination, theology is still. I often joke with John. He said, he's a historian. He's bound by facts. <laughs> <laughs> we theologians, we can transcend facts. We, don't, we deal with alternative facts. <laughs> <laughs> we deal with imagination. We think otherwise. This is reality. Why so? Why not this? I would think it differently. So poem is the way of expressing not only the form, but also the way of thinking, imagination and memory, and allows us to think otherwise. Poem is the way we think as a theologian how the world could be otherwise. Prayers. Without a theology, it's just mere gain, intellectual gain. Uh, maybe interesting, maybe money making, but nothing much after all. But by prayer, I don't mean saying prayers. I haven't said prayer in a long time. But prayer means the reference, the sensibility of the transcendent. Call it whatever you want. Call it Allah. Call it God or Jesus. Call it anything you want. Or the, the Nirvana. The, but there is a dimension of gratitude for what you get in your life. It comes to you as gift. It's not something you <coughs> earn, something that you see as gift. And that's the attitude, Eucharistia, Eucharistic Eucharistia. And then promises. So poems, prayers, and promises. You know, promises is always initiated for someone else. Promises is someone who promises you. And promises is good as long as the person who promises have two things. First, ability to deliver. And second, faithfulness in delivery. So I think that the theologian works on that promise, the divine promise that God will give and God is faithful to God. So thank you very much for all this, and I hope you will have a wonderful reception. And uh, tonight, the party will continue in um, their Irving uh, room. The uh, opening hour, any time, any hour is 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs>